All right, so today I've got someone super special on this channel. So this is Cynthia Thurlow, who has been someone that I have looked up to in this industry for such a long time when it comes down to intermittent fasting. You may have seen her before with her TED Talk that's got upwards of 10 million views on it when it comes down to intermittent fasting. And one thing that she is absolutely amazing at is understanding the complex dynamic with intermittent fasting, especially when it comes down to women. And she has an awesome new book that's coming out. Uh, I'll let her speak to that here in just a second. But Cynthia, thanks for hopping on. Thank you. It's, I've really been looking forward to our conversation. So give us a little background on you. What's, uh, what's, what's your story? How do you get into intermittent fasting? What's, what's your background? Yeah, so I'm a traditional allopathic trained nurse practitioner. My, my whole background is actually in ER medicine and cardiology. And I think when I became a parent, I started to look a little more deeply at the role between nutrition and health and wellness. And over time, you know, watching a child struggle with life-threatening food allergies and kind of diving down a rabbit hole of, of looking at how our, our traditional views are on the lack of importance, really, when we're looking at traditional views on nutrition, it's, it's kind of like it's a secondary consideration. We don't really speak to our patients about uh, the importance of, of what we eat and when we eat. And so for me, I think it was really when I hit the wall of perimenopause, I'll be the first person to say I was doing everything wrong. I'd love to save any woman listening or watching this video or love one of a woman, uh, the headaches that I, um, I went through. And, and so it really started with early forties, very demanding job, as I stated, worked in cardiology. So long hours, very stressful husband had a very demanding international travel schedule, two young boys. And I was probably uh, restricting my carbohydrates a little more than I should have been and over-exercising, not realizing I was doing that. And some of the kind of unique needs of perimenopausal women is that we just don't respond to stress as well as we did when we were younger in our 20s and 30s. And so classic example of you know, a woman who's never struggled with her weight her entire life, all of a sudden I'm gaining weight, I can't sleep, I'm anxious, uh, something was clearly a mess and I was exhausted. And so I initially came to intermittent fasting really as an N of one. I was curious, uh, a colleague of mine had just mentioned it unknowingly. And I read Jason Fung's book, uh, The you know, Complete Guide to Fasting. And, and I felt in my heart that if there was a, another kind of traditionally trained healthcare professional that was advocating and, and supportive of this, that it was something I should really consider. And almost instantaneously, I felt better. I was sleeping better. Uh, my gut health improved. I started to lose weight. Uh, I felt cognitively more clear. And then it kind of bled literally into the work that I was doing, uh, not only with my patients in cardiology, but I had started my own business. And uh, I got to a point where I literally couldn't write another prescription. So I spent 16 years in cardiology as an NP. And one morning I woke up and told my husband I couldn't write another prescription. And it's not to suggest there isn't tremendous value in uh, you know, allopathic medicine. I just really fundamentally felt like I was being called to serve at a higher purpose. And so I left clinical medicine in 2016, jumped into the entrepreneurial space, and then really started to weave intermittent fasting into my work with women uh, fast forward to 2018, and I, as an introvert, as a fellow introvert, I decided that I wanted to do a TED Talk because it would be a big, scary thing to do to get up in front of a large group of people and execute a talk. And so my first talk was on perimenopause. Um, I remember being completely embarrassed that I was talking about what I considered to be this time frame in my life where I'd been given such little information, and I really wanted other women not to to suffer like I had. And the irony is, at the time I accepted that talk, I was offered a second. And the second talk, I said to my husband, what do I know a lot about? And he said, intermittent fasting. And so it was that instantaneously. I didn't put a ton of thought into the topic. It was just something I knew a lot about. And then the venue asked for me to do a slant towards women because they felt that they didn't have enough speakers speaking to just the needs of women. And the rest is really history. I didn't expect uh, that that would ultimately be what I would be so well known for. But now I really feel that, especially given the current climate of metabolic inflexibility and rampant, uh, you know, chronic disease state here in the United States and other Westernized countries, that it's really a call to action. That you know, so many of us have the ability to encourage people to embrace strategies that can be life-altering in really beneficial ways. So 
that's that's actually how I came to fasting, not realizing that I would be in the position now where I had the opportunity to write a book. Um, I'm really excited to be able to share intermittent fasting transformation. Um, goes completely goes out into publication on March 15th, but be able to share what I've learned over the years talking to women and our unique needs about fasting. One of my favorite things to recommend to women that are intermittent fasting, just because they're usually the ones making the decisions for the food in the house, is Thrive Market. Okay, for Thrive Market for intermittent fasting is just awesome, or any kind of dietary pattern. That link below will save you 25% off your initial order with them. So Thrive Market is an online membership-based grocery store. So what that means is you hop on, you use that link down below, and then it sorts by diet type. So maybe you're doing fasting with vegan, or maybe you're doing fasting with keto, or maybe you're just trying to go gluten-free. It sorts everything and makes it super, super easy and convenient. So that link down below saves you 25% off your entire first grocery order. So go ahead and stock up and get your groceries and then they get delivered to your doorstep. Plus, if you use that link, it gives you a free gift as well. So again, if you're implementing fasting and you wanna have good things in your pantry so that you're not making terrible decisions when you are eating, that way you stock yourself with what you need. So definitely recommend it. That link is down below and a big thank you to them for the continued support on this channel. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that I've noticed with my channel is that women that are interested in intermittent fasting, there's a lot of just a lot of noise out there surrounding women in intermittent fasting. And a lot of them come to my channel initially thinking, I don't think I can fast. I don't think fasting's safe for women. I don't think fasting is the right thing for me. And, you know, I know there's a lot of interesting evidence. One of the things that I, I bring up a lot is, you know, women in particular respond very, very well to fasting. And it has to do a lot, well, from a fat loss perspective, women simply do better when it comes down to the catecholamine response in terms of they burn fat better via those adrenaline pathways, better than men. And usually when I say that, it gets them excited. They're like, oh, I can do something better than, better than the guy. Heck yes, <laughs> you know, I'm in. But you know, what do you say to women that are maybe trepidatious about fasting uh, at first? Because I, it's obviously very common. You know, it's a great question. I think a lot of it has to do with the degree of cognitive dissonance. We've been telling patients for years that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. They have to eat frequently to stoke their metabolism. So is it any surprise that women, when they're approached with the concept of eating less often, it seems terrifying? And then couple it with, I, I want to believe that they're well-meaning people out there on social media that put a lot of fear-mongering into women that it's an impossibility, they can't possibly do it, it's too hard on our bodies. And I remind people that we wouldn't be here as a species if the concept of famine and feasting wasn't something that uh, ultimately allowed us to be able to you know, go long periods of time without eating. Now we're in a period of excess. You know, We're in this hedonistic culture where everything is accessible 24 seven, whether it's a movie we wanna watch or food in the middle of the night, we have access to everything uh, consistently. So when I'm talking to people about retraining their thought process, reframing their thoughts, I really start from the position of, this is the way our bodies are designed to thrive. It doesn't mean that every person can fast 20 hours a day, and especially perhaps not women. But what it does beg to is to really understand the physiology and to understand that we are designed to really have lowered insulin levels with the exception of when we eat, you know, in response to the food intake that we bring on board, that we metabolically are not designed to be a garbage can of, you know, eating anywhere from six to 10 times a day. There was a great uh, research uh, study that was put out by Sachin Panda last year, really talking about meal frequency and people were inputting into their phones how frequently they were eating and what I found interesting is it was anywhere from six to 10 times a day. And you think about the net impact for men or for women to be eating six to 10 times a day and what that does metabolically to our hormones. And so I always come from the place of, I under it's always the reassuring place of, I understand this seems scary. Let's go low and slow. I mean, low and slow is kind of my standard mantra. I'm like, listen, let's just start with not snacking. And then, you know, yes. we kind of work beyond that. So it's really peeling back the layers so that people feel empowered that like, okay, this isn't quite so overwhelming. Whereas I probably ripped the bandaid off, which is my personality. I was like, oh, I'm not waiting. I'm just gonna jump yeah. all in. And for me at the stage of life I was in, I had a little bit more flexibility than if I had been 25, 30 or 35. And that's really yeah. the unique you know, needs of women that I, I feel 
on many levels, postmenopausal women and men sometimes have an easier time dipping their toe into the fasting pond as opposed yeah. to women at their peak for fertile years and then women in perimenopause. There's a little bit more nuance and you have to get pretty granular. Definitely. And that, I mean, that opens up a really good discussion surrounding, I mean, insulin resistance in the first place and how that can be such a pivotal thing for all kinds of different ailments and issues that women face. And, you know, a lot of things circumnavigate right back to insulin resistance, whether it's, you know, you talk about PCOS, you talk about, uh, you know, luteinizing hormone, follicle, excuse me, follicle stimulating hormone, how that interplay with insulin resistance plays a role and uh, which we can get into in a lot more depth. But I like what you said, how, you know, first thing is eliminate snacking. And I think that six to 10 times per day, perhaps that's for even how much they're having in an official meal that they're actually logging. I mean, I, when I talk to people, sometimes I see it upwards of 20, 30 times per day that they're actually consuming something, maybe not an actual meal, but especially in Western culture here in the States, it's like, it's so, the amount of times we are putting something in our mouth, whether it be an almond or whether it be one thing and consistently reminding our body that there is no scarcity whatsoever is just flabbergasting. And there's this whole thing called the anti anti fragile concept, which I'm a big fan of. Like that anti fragile concept means it's it's okay to like have a little bit of stress in your life and to be able to understand these little hormetic stressors. Um, so it's very very similar. When people come to me, I tell them usually the same thing. It's like they don't realize that by not eating for 12 hours simply, that is in some way shape or form a form of time restricted eating or time restricted feeding, however you want to look at it. And it's not that hard. In fact, if I talk to even even most men too. Hey, if you just like cut the cream out of your coffee in the morning, there's a good chance you're probably going to be at that 12 hour window before you know it. It's not that hard. And those little teeny things can make such a big shift. And whether someone is fasting and officially calling it fasting or not, make steps towards giving your body a break from food, period. You know, because sometimes fasting is a daunting thing for people to accept and totally appreciate that. But if you just say, hey, you need to give your body a break from food, let insulin levels come down so that the body can actually do its job, then things kind of fall into place. Well, and I think it's also really important for people to understand that, you know, there's this concept of good, better, best. And so if someone is, as an example, if you're eating a standard American diet and you're a couch potato, you might start at a very different place than someone who maybe is really physically intense and maybe they eat a low carb ketogenic diet, um, the transitional period and the flux between you, there's no comparison. So I would say the comparisonitis on, you know, the on social media is profound. Like there's always the extremist. There's always someone who wants to take things to an extreme. And then there are people who are just trying to do a little bit better. So that's the concept of slow and steady. I would say good, better, best. Like maybe in the beginning, you take out the snacks and then you start to, you know, do 12 hours of not eating. And maybe the next thing you do is, Maybe initially, if you are primarily using carbs as your primary fuel source and you're really metabolically inflexible, you may need a little bit of MCT oil in your coffee or your tea to kind of get you from 12 hours to 13 hours. But understanding that a lot of those strategies are what I affectionately call, you know, uh, you've got your training wheels on and that's okay. Like just like when a kid's learning how to ride a bike, training wheels go on to protect them. And then when they're ready to, to ride their bike without the training wheels, then you take them off. And so it's the yeah. same concept. Like we're all like my endeavor is always to get people moving towards clean fasting and understanding what that represents so yeah. they can get the best results. Because I, I'm sure we're very aligned in that a lot of people dirty fast and then they wonder why they're not getting the results that they wanted. And I'm surprised quite honestly at how many uh, men and women will reach out on social media. I'm sure it happens to you as well. And they'll talk to you about what they're putting in their coffee and having in their tea and chewing gum and Oh, but stevia doesn't count. And I mean, it, you know, all these, you know, kind of incremental things that ultimately could be creating enough resistance that they can't lose the weight or that whatever goal they're trying to attain. I always say weight loss resistance is uh, kind of like peeling an onion that it, it, it's never as easy as people assume it is that, it, oh, it has to just be because of this. No, really, it's six different things all coming yeah. together at the same time. And as you mentioned, hormetic stressors, it's the right amount of stress at the right time for your body. That could be very different for all of us. And yes. I find a lot of people, they want to push the envelope with fasting. They want to over restrict their food intake. 
Um, they don't want to sleep enough. They don't want to, you know, just like we have to have rest days when we lift, uh, it's because of what happens with our bodies. And, and much like when we're not eating, that gives our bodies time to repair, get rid of disease disordered cells. I think that's important for people to understand, like you're just not doing nothing when you're not eating. Like there's actual yeah. mechanisms that go on that uh, are working very efficiently to try to clean up the gunk and the goo and the junk that we've eaten, maybe the things that, you know, we went on vacation or we overindulged when we went to a restaurant. Uh, you know, certainly there are so many things that can contribute to people uh, not getting the results they want. But a lot of times I find it's, they get in their own way without realizing it. it's not intentional. They just don't realize that all those, those little indiscretions will ultimately add up. Yeah, they add up. And I think having an underlying understanding of what the ultimate goal is with fasting helps because when people come into it with a sort of a, a clouded idea of like, what am I ultimately after? And the, what you're after is simple. It's not necessarily weight loss. It's really is what we've been talking about. It's giving your body a break from food so that it can upregulate other processes. And when they understand that, oh, I'm just sure I had the training wheels on, but my goal is to get to X. And if they understand that, then they can trim things away. They can start eliminating those variables that might be clouding the result because they know that, okay, the ultimate goal is abstaining from food, you know, for X amount of time, which with that, especially, I find it especially important with women. It's important equally with both, but I find just the mindset of women, they tend to focus so much on the fasting that they forget sometimes that the eating period is equally important to give attention to. And I see it happen. I'm sure you see it happen all the time. Um, I am personally of rather addictive nature. So I understand that I am at risk for getting addicted to fasting to the point where I push it and want to start pushing it longer and longer. And there is a line of diminishing return depending on frequency and everything like that. So I always caution women just to say, Hey, you know, there's nothing wrong with a quitting a fast early if you need to, as long as you're exercising control and you understand, but B you don't have to be progressively increasing the lengths of your fast until you're doing four day fasts every week. That's not necessarily, you know, take it bit by bit and remember that a little step towards improving that insulin sensitivity and improving your ability to nourish your body during your eating window. That's, that's what we're after. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, the other piece that is so important is that women are so regulated by our hormones so when women are still cycling every month i mean there there are times during their menstrual cycle period you know during this infradian rhythm this 28 day cycle there are times when they're they're more estrogen rich you know the follicular phase beginning part of their menstrual cycle uh, they are going to be more able to work out more intensely they're going to be more able to fast longer versus the luteal phase like preceding when they actually have their bleed and I remind women all the time, it's no wonder, like I will ask women when they'll say, oh my gosh, I'm so tired and I can barely make it to 14 hours. And the first thing I ask is, where are you in your menstrual cycle? Oh, yeah. I'm gonna get my period in three days. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm never a fan of people pushing the fasting window around their menstrual cycle. Like the five to seven days preceding their cycle, they really should back off. Like 12 hours of digestive rest, as I affectionately refer to it, or 13 hours is fine. Um, I find that women are much more sensitive to fasting. They, the level of intense activity has to kind of back off. I always say progesterone predominates in the luteal phase, and you really want to do things to help facilitate uh, supporting that time because your body in many ways thinks it potentially could go on to um, have a pregnancy. And so it's very, uh, very sensitive to nutrient depletion. It's very sensitive to stress. Um, I remind women, as an example, when they're in perimenopause that uh, you know, initially we have this drop in progesterone and that can manifest initially in the beginning stages of perimenopause, which could be a five or a 10 year process, depending on the woman that you may have sleep disturbances. You may be anxious and depressed. Um, you may have a heavier menstrual cycle, but what comes through that is this sometimes estrogen dominance, which can drive the, you know, breast pain and, you know, heavier menses and all these other things. But as you get farther along in perimenopause, you become more insulin resistant. And this is a really key concept for people to understand that yes, you can be doing all the right things heading into perimenopause, but your body doesn't have as much latitude. You know, your adrenals are taking a little bit of a hit uh, because of this faltering progesterone in the ovaries. Our ovaries are as old as we are. We're not like men where we're replenishing sperm throughout our lifetime. Uh, so if your ovaries are 45 years old, 
those eggs are 45 years old. You might not be ovulating every month. You're not producing as much progesterone. So the adrenals come in to kind of pick up the slack. And that means you don't have as much buffering from stress. Same thing with sleep. You can become physiologically more insulin resistant. This makes women really angry, especially the thin women who are used to have never having had to worry about weight gain or weight loss resistance in their lifetime. And so there's a lot of um, give and take. And, and for every woman that effortlessly goes on to fast in their 40s, I probably have twice as many that have to work with those nuances because of the hormones at play. And, and I think anyone would be remiss to say that we really have, phys there's so many wonderful things about being a woman, and there's so many magical things about this orchestration of hormones that goes on in our bodies month to month, leading into perimenopause and menopause, but it also means we have to look at things a little differently. Like you mentioned earlier, you know, our brains are very sensitive to nutrient depletion, you know, that the concept of famine, I always say like, I look at a woman's menstrual cycle as like a fifth or sixth vital sign. Yeah. So as an example, if a woman who's lean in her early thirties wants to fast once or twice a week, I generally don't have a problem with that. However, if, uh, you know, her period's a little bit wonky for a cycle or two, maybe it's a little lighter, a little heavier, not a big deal. It should work itself out. But if her period goes away and she's not pregnant, that's a sign it could be too much stress. And so really kind of leaning into your menstrual cycle and saying, what is my body trying to tell me? And some people just don't have as much reserve. I, I look at lean women as a really good example. Um, and we even have lean phenotypes with PCOS. And sometimes yeah. women don't even know they have PCOS till they try to go get pregnant. And then all of a sudden they realize they have this luteal phase defect and yeah. they can't get pregnant as, as, as easily as they thought because they have a progesterone deficiency. So I know I've gotten off on a little bit of a tangent, but really just speaking to the unique physiology that goes on with women, we have to kind of lean into what makes us unique. Um, understand it doesn't mean that we can't fast. It just means we have to have a little, there are a little more caveats, a little more considerations to ensure that we can fast safely. Definitely. And, and you brought up such a good point about, uh, you know, women that have been lean their entire life and then they reach perimenopause or menopause and they start all of a sudden battling uh, you know, insulin resistance to a certain degree. A lot of times too, they have been battling insulin resistance, but insulin resistance doesn't always manifest in weight gain. I think that's a common misconception that just because someone is even type two diabetic or insulin resistant, it doesn't mean that you're automatically gaining weight. And sometimes all you need is the catalyst of a hormonal flux for it to start changing. And uh, so I say that because there's a, a large demographic of younger women in their 20s and 30s that I think get benefit from intermittent fasting as I'm careful to say certain words here, but almost as an, a protective mechanism for the future. Because again, you take the lean women are almost the ones that are in a weird wraparound way, almost more at risk because they don't have something in the mirror telling them that maybe something's going on metabolically and maybe there's some mitochondrial dysfunction that's occurring there because in the mirror, everything looks fine. And then all of a sudden they reach this hormonal change and then it rears its ugly head. So it's almost like, hey, you don't have to adopt this intermittent fasting literal lifestyle where it's something you do every day or even three times a week. But if you can exercise some control with the timing of your meals, you know, just to be able to improve that insulin sensitivity and improve the levels of insulin resistance and your HOMA IR, sort of your homeostatic levels of insulin resistance as a lagging indicator, that could potentially be very powerful as a tool for you going into perimenopause. And I think sometimes ladies don't like to, they don't want to think about that future because it's, it's depressing to think about it. But if you can put these systems in place, there's pretty good evidence that it might set you up for more success going into them. Yeah. And I, I think had I known in my twenties and thirties, what I know now, I absolutely would have been one of those people who said, you know, this is absolutely the direction for things to go in because I think a lot of women, you know, women who were well-meaning, I mean, I was certainly eating, you know, I was gluten-free, I was grain-free. I mean, I was doing all the right things and yet it still happened. And so I think for many, many people, and I even heard this from my own, I'm embarrassed to say this, my own physician said to me, well, Cynthia, I mean, you're in your forties, like maybe this is just the way things were meant to be. And I remember that was like a lightning rod. I was like, if I'm hearing this, there are thousands of women that are hearing the same thing. And many of them, I'm feisty. So when, when I heard that, that made me mad. Maybe other women just got depressed and sad, but yeah. I used it, it galvanized me to say, 
if this is happening to me, it is happening to thousands of other women. And I don't want people to feel like they don't have any control. I don't want people to feel like they don't, they can't be inspired and empowered to make different choices so that this is not their destiny. And I, I love that you're suggesting that even women, younger women, lean women, even consider this as something that they do as a like a weekly check in, or maybe they do it twice a week yeah. um, as something that can improve, you know, as you mentioned, mitochondrial function, insulin sensitivity. And that's really what it's all about. You know, when we look at how profoundly unhealthy we are as a population, we got to do, we have to do something to change things. And I, I think it's, it's this massive public health threat at this point. So I, I would argue that, you know, especially menopausal, perimenopausal women, absolutely women that are st still at their peak fertility years and, and lean um, and or lean, I, I think there's value in embracing this concept, even if it's just, you know, the first two weeks of your menstrual cycle, and then giving your body an opportunity to have some digestive rest the rest of your cycle, I think can really go a long way. And largely because I think it's human nature. It's one thing to eat less often. It's 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 totally another for people to completely change their nutrition. And, and I will be the first person to tell you, I've had thousands of women who have gone through my programs that have said things like, well, I didn't change anything about what I was eating, but I lost weight because they were eating yeah. less frequently. And then over time, as they start feeling better, then they're encouraged like, okay, maybe it's time to pull out some of these inflammatory foods uh, because they're looking to, you know, change body composition. It's, it's almost like once they get a win, then, then it's, it's kind of like the domino effect. Then they're yeah. willing to do more, uh, to really look and, and investigate this. But I do find for a lot of women, it's a source of tremendous frustration. You know, they'll say, even if you look at the research, if you look at men and women, men will lose weight faster with intermittent fasting, but over a period of like eight weeks, women will also lose yep. weight, but it also speaks to the fact that we are governed by our hormones. It isn't yeah. nearly as straightforward as it is for men. I always laugh at my husband, who's the same weight he was in college, and he wears it like a badge of honor at this point, because um, <laughs> we're both middle-aged. But I think it just really speaks to the fact that men and women can do this successfully. Women have to do it a little differently, though. Yeah, and you, I mean, you nailed it with something that I mentioned on my channel quite a bit, which is you know, during the estrogen phase versus the progesterone phase, um, the progesterone phase is also very catabolic in nature, which means that you run the risk of breaking down muscle tissue much more during that phase too. And when you look at it on paper, it can be deceiving because the progesterone phase on paper makes it sound like you're going to burn more fat during that phase. Because when you look at it, basically it's saying, okay, well, all these catecholamines are, are elevated and that means, okay, good, I'm going to get more fat loss out of it. That might literally be the case on paper, but the amount of muscle that you waste along with that during that phase makes it a moot point. Like you don't want to go that route. Um, and I do the same thing. I usually suggest if people are, you know, yeah, trim it down to a 12 hour eating window during that phase. I mean, your body, you do have to listen to your body. And with men, it is a little bit more straightforward. With men, I can tell them to kind of muscle through it a little bit because yes, there is a certain element of it that is psychosomatic. But with women, there is a much stronger signal that is just biologically happening with what to do. And uh, I've noticed it with, with my own wife and it was like with, with, during the estrogen phase, it's like, wow, I can just go without eating. It's like, it's fine. Like, and then all of a sudden, you know, as the month goes on, then the cravings start coming in and that is a real thing. And there's a lot of interesting content on the internet in general, but there's interesting content that seems to say that that's all psychological, that there's no, no, that is bona fide pretty darn clear that appetite increases, all that increases during that phase, during that progesterone phase, which is why it is so dang hard to fast during that phase. You have every possible signal in your body telling you to eat. <laughs> and it's, so it's really, really difficult. So yeah, I usually recommend that with women too. It's like during that, you know, estrogen phase of the cycle, lean into that, lean into that. And that's also when, believe it or not, you can put on muscle if you wanted to. It's much harder to put on muscle in the progesterone phase. So fasting, building muscle, lifting a little bit heavier, going for that muscle during that period of time. Uh, it's just a really good point to bring up. So what, um, you know, if someone is getting started and they've started say doing maybe a 12 hour gap, what's kind of the next thing that you would advise for a lady to do if she's, uh, Let's say they're not perimenopausal, excuse me, perimenopausal, or they're not postmenopause. They're just, you know, in their 20s and their 30s. They've already started trimming down to 12 hours a day. 
uh, of fasting. What do you kind of suggest as the next step? Well, I think the macros piece is really important. I find most, if not all women, grossly under eat the amount of animal-based protein. And I, I'll be the, I'll, I'll just say I'm outing myself and saying I, animal protein is superior to plant-based protein. But next thing is really hitting your protein macros so that you're satiated. I, I, I find that most of us are eating too many carbs, not enough protein, and wondering why our appetite cues are, are you know misrouted. So it's really sitting down and, and creating opportunities to explain that you know your first meal of the day should be protein dense. Uh, that will allow you to get from breakfast to lunch and lunch to dinner. You know, especially if we're starting out and this is someone who's removed snacking and now they're doing a 12-hour fast really making sure you're hitting, you know, 30 to 40 grams. And this is for a woman, 30 to 40 grams of protein in your meal that will shut off those appetite cues. It'll, you'll feel full. You should not get hungry in between meals. I always say, if you're hungry in between meals, you either need to increase that protein lever or add in some healthy fats. And I use the example of salmon has healthy fats in it. I think this is where sometimes lower carb or ketogenic diets really throw people the understanding that sometimes your protein has the healthy fats in it. If you have a ribeye or a piece of salmon, you don't need to add half an avocado. <laughs> Most yeah. women don't need to do that. And that's usually where I see women, you know, sometimes making mistakes. So it's really, we're going from um, no longer snacking to doing 12 hours to really restacking those macros. And once they, they understand how they feel when they're satiated and full, then we can work on kind of widening those fasting windows. And, and that's when I see tremendous success, that people all of a sudden are like, okay, I've done two weeks of you know adjusting my protein macros. I feel full, I feel satiated, I'm sleeping better, I have more energy, I've lost a couple pounds. You know, That's always a, a great uh, starting point. People feel encouraged, they've, they've, you know, they've won. Um, and then you know, also being cognizant of where they are in their menstrual cycle. So obviously, uh, you know, during the follicular phase, you can push the envelope with workouts. You, uh, you know, tend to be a little more insulin sensitive. So if you want to have a larger portion of high quality carbohydrate, I'm not anti-carb, let me be very clear. Uh, if you want a sweet potato or squash, or if you do well with low glycemic berries or a tart apple, you know, certainly not restricting your carbohydrates, depending on how metabolically flexible you are to begin with. Uh, and then as you head into the luteal phase, kind of leaning into, you know, what your body's needs are. I find most women need maybe about a hundred more calories per day. Oftentimes that's when I'll encourage a slightly larger portion of some high quality carbohydrate along with their protein, and then really leaning into what their body's telling them because cravings, unfortunately get a really bad rap. I, I find that sometimes cravings are really indic indicative of some need that's not being met. Uh, I tend to crave salt uh, when I need to lean into stress management. And yeah. so I've learned to be copious about my salt. I add salt to just about everything. And I find even sometimes putting a little bit of salt on my tongue, when, even when I'm feeling like I'm craving sugary things, it's really that my body needs more adrenal support. So I really yeah. lean into that. So getting back to your original, your original question, that's usually the second level of things that I will work on that I find, you know, in order to get success with being able to go from one meal to the next, it's really stacking those macros properly. And I find for a lot of women that when they stop being so carbohydrate focused and they're not denying themselves, but they're not sitting down with a big bowl of pasta or rice um, or some type of you know bread, once they start eating a, a, a large good sized portion of protein along with non-starchy vegetables and um, some healthy fats, they feel so much better. You know, they, their, their energy levels, their mental clarity, are, have improved so substantially that it's very easy for them to consider or to continue with those kinds of eating habits as opposed to going back to what they were doing before when they were having energy slumps, they were tired. I always say if you're tired after a meal, you really need to investigate what your macros were to really see what, what was not serving you well. Yeah, no, I totally, totally agree. And with you, when you look at someone entering into a fast, there's things that you can do as well to make a fast easier. And one of the things that you mentioned was, you know, being relatively low carb. And I'm not implying that women need to even go keto. And I think that's, that's something that's a discussion for a different day. But I mean, just because someone is doing intermittent fasting doesn't mean that they have to do keto. And I think just because a lot of the same people in that metabolic circle talk about both things, they automatically assume that they have to be done together. Uh, they absolutely don't. Carbohydrates are perfectly fine. I you know, butt heads sometimes with the ketogenic community on that because I, I want to make sure that we're opening a big enough door for people to 
understand metabolic health and mitochondrial function. And by alienating carbohydrates, for some people, you're alienating the opportunity for them to get a tremendous benefit from fasting. So, um, but I will say that as someone that has, that does both intermittent fasts with carbohydrates and also intermittent fasts alongside keto, depending on what time of year it is for me, uh, it is very much so easier to fast if you are going into it in a lower carbohydrate state, simply because you're having less of the way of the, you know, the signaling that's telling you to eat because you're not having the blood sugar roller coaster ride. So typically if someone is starting a fast male or female, it really is nice to at least have the last meal of the day before going into a fast being a lower carb meal so that you're not having to have this big spike in glucose or even a gentle bell curve of glucose that's going to end up dropping and making you crave something first thing in the morning. I just find that that's a good strategy. Even if you are consuming carbohydrates leading into your fast, higher fiber, higher veggie intake, higher fat intake, higher protein, keep the carbohydrates low. And it usually makes life a little bit easier as you're getting used to it. Yeah. And I, th I think it's also helpful for people to understand that we become over the course of a day more progressively more insulin resistant as the yes. day goes on. So I always say, if you're going to have a carbohydrate load, have it earlier in the day, you know, make sure that your meal is done within three to four hours of bedtime. You know, the whole concept of chronobiology, like I am completely nerding out right now on the benefits of melatonin uh, and how it, it's far beyond just a hormone, all the antioxidant benefits, yep. but really reminding people that we want to be supporting our bodies. And so one of the things that has happened over the past two years, not having to be in carpool 24 seven, which is very much my life, normally was that I was able to close my feeding window earlier. And I was like, wow, you know, not only do I feel better, my blood sugar is better. I wear a continuous glucose monitor. So I know the net impact. And I said, what's the difference? I'm like, oh, I'm finishing my feeding window by five o'clock. And yeah. for people who have children at home, my kids understand that I just mom eats earlier in the day and it isn't a big deal. I sit with my entire family and eat breakfast, eat dinner. But I think it's important for people to find what works best for them. But I'm starting to see for women, most of the women I work with, they do better shutting that feeding window down a little earlier. It may not be seven days out of the week, but maybe five days out of the week, they're getting blood, better blood sugar response. And then also educating them, same thing happens to men too, you become a little more insulin resistant as the day goes on. So yeah. I'm definitely much more cognizant of the carbohydrates I consume with my last meal of the day than I am at the beginning of my feeding window. Although I'm, I'm also someone that does not I don't, I just don't feel good when I, when I eat a lot of carbohydrates in general. I mean, I can have yeah. protein with a carb or protein with some healthy fats. And that's usually the lever. It's always, protein's always consistent, but the carbs and fats, depending on my physical activity, what I've been doing, um, is certainly really important. Yeah. You, you nailed it. That's like my favorite, probably my favorite study is a BMC medical genomics study that I reference all the time, which is it's just that it's the, as you become more insulin resistant as the day goes on. And with that, whether you are fasting or not earlier in your eating window or earlier in the day, if a non fasting day, that would be when the bulk of your calories should come in. And that sounds a little bit counterintuitive from a fasting discussion, because it's like on one hand, we're saying skip breakfast. On the other hand, we're saying on days you're not fasting, eat a big breakfast. I'm not agreeing with necessarily the mainstream narrative of breakfast being the most important meal of the day. But what I am agreeing with is the fact that we can get by with having, you know, 40% of our calories in the morning and then slowly kind of trickle it off as the day goes on because we just simply have less ability to potentially store it in the morning. And it's pretty simple, biologically speaking, we're awake, it's morning, we're going to be using that fuel throughout the course of the day. So of course, every power of our body's being is going to try to utilize that for its literal fuel. And then as the day goes on, trickle it off. And with that, I've noticed for men and women both, that sometimes it's fun to just say, hey, I'm not going to intermittent fast by skipping breakfast. Today, I'm going to intermittent fast by skipping dinner and just do something completely different, flip the paradigm on its head. And then let's say, hey, maybe you stopped eating at 3 p.m. one day a week. Well, then you get up in the morning and it's 7 a.m. and you go work out or something in the morning. Well, guess what? You just gained four hours on your fast. You know, so now you're working out four hours deeper into a fast and it hasn't even really processed in your brain. You just went to bed and got up and you didn't change the time of day that you eat in the morning. So it, you just, you're, you're quickly adding a couple hours onto your fast without really thinking about it. And for me personally, like I cut it off at about six and it's amazing because then by the time I get up, I got little kids. So they're up early. You know, I'm up at five, five 30. I'm working out. I'm working out at six. I'm like, wow, I'm already pretty deep in a fast. 
So it's just a quick way to, to leverage a little bit more out of it and also keeps it fresh. And I feel like being able to fast throughout different periods of the day potentially elicits different benefits because fasting acts as this big lever that you're pulling and you can pull this lever during certain hormonal fluxes and you can pull it during other hormonal fluxes and potentially get different benefits from each. So if your body is finding you just getting used to the same system of skipping breakfast, perhaps you're going to adapt to that. And it's time to just say, okay, you know what? Forget it. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to fast through dinner for a couple days this week. And all of a sudden plateaus are broken and you're, you're back on your merry way of losing weight. And I find, especially with women that seems to click, but I know that it's very difficult from a social standpoint to skip dinner. And especially for parents, for moms, because you're setting an example with your kids and sometimes it's hard, but that's just it. You're setting an example for your kids. And my kids know the same kind of thing. We all sit down and we all eat dinner around five. Some people make fun of us because that's early, but whatever, you know, then we're all good. Then we have time to go for a walk. We have time to enjoy our evening and we're not going straight from dinner time into bedtime routine. We have a little bit of a gap in between. So you just kind of reframe your life and kids, you know, little kids don't know the difference. They just know what mom and dad are doing and you can instill some really good habits. So I always encourage moms to, hey, like reframe how you're thinking at things. You're not disrupting the family dynamic. You are leading the charge. And you can, you don't need to force your kids into fasting, but you can teach them proper chronobiology and meal timing. And that's ammunition for them to really set them up for life. Well, and I think it's a really good point of, of encouraging people to find what works for them and their family. I mean, obviously I have teenagers and so my teenagers oftentimes aren't done with sports until eight, nine o'clock at night. So they will come home. They will eat what we affectionately refer to as the second dinner. And, uh, you know, they, they, they've become, they become so independent that they actually enjoy that they get, you know, 20 minutes to decompress. But when my kids were younger, they ate dinner at five or five 30. We yeah. enjoyed that. You know, they were in bed by seven. Um, it was definitely a different time frame. And you know, obviously I have all boys, so we're had a very, we still have a very active household, but even on, you know, on the weekends, it's a very protected time for us. We all sit down, eat dinner together. And we generally tend to eat on the earlier side. And my kids are fine with that. They understand that, you know, mom and dad, my husband also fasts. We enjoy fasting. We don't enjoy eating later dinners, um, but we will all sit down as a family. And and there are plenty of times when sometimes my, my husband and my boys are eating dinner. I will sit down with them. I'll hear about their day, but they, they don't see that as a strange thing. They actually know this is something that mom does and is well known for and so we respect the fact that sometimes her feeding window is going to conflict with when she might be eating dinner and that's okay so i I don't want anyone to feel like somehow they're missing out i sit down with my family almost every night and enjoy eating dinner with them uh it's just now that they're older you know sometimes there are two dinners instead of one uh obviously i'm not eating two dinners but they oftentimes are but they're also growing and to your point uh i have a 14 year old competitive swimmer and the one thing, you know, I generally don't recommend fasting for children because they're yeah. growing. But I'm, it's interesting watching my 14-year-old leaning into intuitively eating. And so he has to be up so early for school in the morning that on the weekends he'll sleep until 10 or 11. He's been fasting all night long. Sometimes he's going 16 hours from dinner on Friday night to when he eats on Saturday late morning. And I just said, you know, don't feel like if you get up on Saturday morning, you're not ready to eat. You can give it a little bit of time, but there are some days where he will fast and it's really more him leaning into his body, but he has two enormous meals in between when he gets home from school and when he goes to bed. And I always say somehow this kid is getting in plenty of macronutrients, but I think it's very interesting that, you know, for those of us, we are, these habits are rubbing off on our children. And my kids are definitely like leaning into the concept of intuitive eating and not forcing themselves to eat when they're not hungry, which I think can be a very valuable lesson to learn at a younger age, because there are many of us that are programmed to just eat all day long. And really I want adults and, you know, teenagers to be able to like listen to their body's cues, letting them know when they need to eat, when it's appropriate to eat. And when, you know, they're not eating for hunger, they're eating for other reasons. And they have a constant stimulus coming at them from social media and everything like that. And that's a whole different discussion again on dopamine in general, just we're, we're constantly needing a fix of some kind. And especially with the younger generation, I mean, myself included, I notice a direct correlation between how hooked I am on my phone and checking things on my phone with 
how I just need that dopamine hit from something. And if food and snacks is what's accessible, then that's where I'm going to go for that dopamine hit. So being able to just let kids understand that, hey, like if the stimulus just isn't consistently there, then magically that dopamine need, that itch that you're dying to scratch all the time just kind of goes away too. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just an important thing. And I feel like it's really funny, you know, we'll, we'll wrap up here in just a minute. We're going to do a, you know, a part two on intermittent fasting mistakes that we'll post up, but it's really funny. It's kind of lighthearted. My son, there's two situations in particular where I was in a bad mood for whatever reason. One reason he says, mom, dad's just mad because he didn't work out hard this morning. Like, okay, cool. <laughs> no, and that's, that's, they understand like, what makes they they just understand that like i'm in a good mood when i go work out and i do that and the other thing he said was a very similar situation dad's just in a bad mood because he ate too big of a dinner and <laughs> it's <laughs> this Insightful. is kind of funny yeah they just see him like okay well you know, he, he just hears the things i talk about he probably sees my videos and background and stuff like that so it's just it just goes to show that they do pick up on just all this stuff and i just thought that was kind of fun and lighthearted. but uh cynthia where can everyone find you and where can they find your book too yeah, thank you. So Intermittent Fasting Transformation, you can buy it off of Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, your local bookstore. Um, easiest place to find me is my website, www.cynthiatherlow.com. I'm active on Instagram and Facebook and on Twitter. I'm a bit snarky. I'll forewarn everyone. And I have a great podcast, which I hope to have Thomas on very soon, called Everyday Wellness. Perfect. All right, Cynthia. Well, thank you very much. And Keep it locked in because we'll have another video coming out here in a few weeks on common fasting mistakes that women make.